John Sabair producing the show. R.J. Young of Fox Sports, National College Football Writer, is going to be joining us momentarily. Speaking of football, the transfer portal is alive and well. And, Cole, we don't talk about punters and kickers too much on this show. But certainly newsworthy that Alabama has actually picked up a punter from the portal. We, we, we try not to talk to them about them very much. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is actually a good get. Um, we'll keep it in context of actually talking about Good. And punters, but uh, I know for a fact that this was one that uh, there was real fear uh, as far as losing from Troy, and it's a it's a big loss for Troy. It's an unfortunate loss for them because I think they got a chance. Ship's got a chance to have a pretty good season. But uh, Jack Martin, Dothan, Alabama native, uh, announced that he will transfer to Alabama. He averaged over 46 yards per punt in 23 games for Troy, so a ton of experience. Uh, he's had success. And I think this will this will help make Alabama a little bit better. Uh, I don't know how much better they need to be in actually punting the football. Uh, we don't know what the offense will be like this year as much as we did last year. But um, he's a guy that's had a lot of success playing college football, and I think he'll help that team. So, you know, we're, we're seeing it again where a lot of people wanted this rule to be put in place because they thought it was going to help everybody. And there are certain teams it seems to be helping a whole lot more than uh, than the masses. Yeah, and that's not a, the only portal news. We'll get into that. Some uh, notable portal news concerning Auburn, and we're going to talk about uh, Auburn's coach Brian Harson right now. RJ, sports national college football writer, joining us on the Ultra Organic Seltzer Hotline. RJ, hope you're doing well. Thanks for taking time. Uh, we typically get grades for new coaching hires when it comes to this time of year. A lot remains to be seen but i want you to first with before we go into your list and some of the, the grades you gave for particular coaches brian harson being one of them what factors do you consider when you give these grades and you assign these grades to these new new coaching hires across college football thanks for having me on guys that that's the first thing i need to say second thing i need to say is didn't you, i feel like we can't talk about any of this before we mention the tennessee youth pastor that prank called nick saban over a kicker like i feel like that's relevant <laughs> to the transfer portal conversation. I just, I wanted to throw that in there, and I was going, man, I'm jogging my, yes, that was right, East Tennessee. But to answer your question, all right, who was out there? Who did we think, we, you, I, dudes that do this for a living, think fits there? Who actually was going to say yes to the job? And who did you end up getting, right? So I think one of the ways in which we couch this is, say, a dude like Billy Napier, which I know you guys are familiar with, right? Arizona State to ULL. Oh, yeah, did this thing at Alabama where he's pretty good. And yet he's still at ULL, right? And then John Salty coming up with the goods, right, for AL.com and how that search for Auburn in particular went. And what did you lose, right? Is Brian Harson a trade-up from Gus Malzahn? That's really the question that you have to start with with Auburn. And that's what I started with with each one of these hires. RJ, when you look at – what if one of those coaches were to have turned it down, um, which is what we heard that Billy Napier kind of just said no to mm. Auburn? Does that change your opinion at all as to what the next guy was or how you would grade the next hire that did come in? Yeah, because I'm grading you on firing the guy that you had. Like, you're paying, you're paying out money anytime you fire one of these guys. Somebody's coming up with good. Somebody's going into the red there. Now, we can talk about where that money comes from if you want, but that's first. Did you get a guy? who is better or we think is better than the guy that you ended up with, right? Now, in the case of Gus Malzahn, all that dude did was, you know, win, you know, and have a losing season. I mean, pretty good at this. And for Auburn, you know what? Everybody says no disrespect when they mean disrespect. I'm just going to say it. Auburn, you're Auburn, okay? It's fine. It's cool. Gene Chizik won a national championship with you, all right? That's the, we don't say that enough. Gene Chizik won a national championship at Auburn. Nobody else might ever do that, right? And yet and still, Gus Malzahn somehow wore out his welcome again even after you decided to pay him and you're paying this huge buyout. So you need to go swing for the fences and you need to impress the hell out of all of us with your next hire. Brian Harson is a good coach. He's a very good coach. 
Is he better than, better than Gus Malzahn? We'll find out. But right now, I'm grading the athletic department. I'm grading the search committee. Not so much the head coach. Okay, with that being said, you just told us your criteria. Talk to us about why Josh Heupel would be at A- minus and Shane Beamer is even higher than Brian Harson at Auburn. Because we don't know what we're getting in Shane Beamer. We only know the pedigree. And when I look at the pedigree of Shane Beamer, the guys he's worked for, and the way that he's gone about building his reputation, yeah, I like this. I like this is because a guy who could take a head coaching job four or five years ago, quite honestly, and didn't. He wanted to go learn every side of the ball except offense, right? He ends up being an offensive assistant for Lincoln Riley, but never wanting to be a coordinator. He has tremendous background in special teams, great background in defense. He understands the area that he is recruiting, and he's going to be the polar opposite of Will Muschamp when it comes to how, you, how palatable he is to media, how palatable he is to fans. This is a family man first and foremost. I think you needed that sort of a culture change at South Carolina. Now, to Josh Heupel, Danny White went back to the well. I respect the hell out of that. He didn't look a gift horse in the mouth. He said, no, nah, I got a great head coach over there with SEC experience who won a national championship as a player, who was an offensive coordinator at Oklahoma, which is synonymous with offensive football, and turned, quite frankly, it into the past happy offense that it was before Lincoln Riley got there. Did an outstanding job at Central Florida taking over for Scott Frost, going in there and saying, hey, guys, y'all are pretty good at this. We just looked at your resume, right? You won a national championship. Yeah, I said it. 2017 national championship. And said to them, hey, guys, I want to figure out how you guys do this. I want to fit into what you're doing. We're going to run some of my stuff, but I want to be a part of your culture and made himself the head coach in that way. And I think when you go into a place like Tennessee where we know just by looking at the exits in the transfer portal, you can recruit to that place. Can you develop at that place? Can you put an offense out there that is going to inspire fans, that is going to inspire the folks in Knoxville, that is going to actually put fear into somebody in the SEC East? I don't know. Any of those things. I like that hire. I like that hire quite a bit, especially knowing that, yeah, Billy Napier says no to this, right? Okay, can you get somebody that was better than Jeremy Pruitt? I think Josh Heupel is better hire than Jeremy Pruitt. RJ Young, Fox Sports, talking college football. I want to go back to the, the Brian Harson uh, grade that you gave and, and the B- minus and some of the other names, and you said swing for the fences, your Auburn. Of the names that were actually mentioned and and the guys that were out there, one of them was, was Mario Cristobal. Mm. Mario Cristobal, would that have been a better hire than Brian Harson? Oh, yeah. Yeah, look at what he's done at Oregon. Look at his background, right? Offensive line at Alabama. I mean, this is dude also went to the U. Like, there's a lot of things to like about Mario Cristobal. And I would have loved to seen him in the SEC, but he's kind of got this thing humming up there at Oregon. They get a W in Columbus this September. Yeah, we're going to talk about them in a real way. Plus, you're talking about the money aspect of this. Mario Cristobal is going to get everything he wants and then some to go do what he really, really wants to do, which is recruit, right? The way that I look at that is he recruits like an SEC West-West school, right? They build defensively, and then they go get their offensive players. I would, I mean, yes, that would have been an A-plus hire if you could go get Mario Cristobal out of Oregon, but that's not what happened. They went to go get the guy out of Boise State. And if you heard the folks from Boise State, they weren't that unhappy to lose him. Like, that's a red flag to me. It's a red flag to me when somebody says, take him. We didn't, we didn't really like where we were anyway. And you put that guy in a Power 5 job where every year he has to play Alabama, LSU, and Texas A&M when they're good. All right, we'll see how that goes. Maybe, maybe, maybe it turns out to be a home run hire, right? But today, nah, I gave it the grade I gave it. Talking with R.J. Young, college football analyst for Fox Sports. You can follow him on Twitter at R.J. underscore Young. He joins us on the Ultra Organic Seltzer Hotline. Speaking of money and money being thrown around, on one of your recent shows, you discussed name, image, likeness, specifically in the Southeastern Conference. Can you project forward just how you believe that will look once the dust settles, everything clears, and it's allowed across the board, particularly in this league? Yeah, man, that's like predicting how the pandemic's going to affect college football, right? Now, we can look maybe next month and to July, but what I think you're going to see is a proliferation of those bills, right? The way that I couch this is I believe name, image, and likeness is the biggest thing to come to college sports since integration and the proliferation of television revenue money, period, because you're going to have opportunities to try to sell your program and sell the businesses around your program to any one of these kids. And in the SEC, 
particularly where we know what college football is, there are a lot of people that want to get into business with these players, particularly those of the five-star caliber. And if you believe the studies, you're talking about between $500,000 and $600,000 annually for some of these kiddos just for being on campus and doing what they would normally do. Now, I think because you have bills in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, you got a leg up here and you got a head start. Now it's about how do you implement those things? Because anything that looks like it's impeding the progress of name, image, and likeness, we're going to frown upon, or at least I am, because I'm an advocate of the kids here. I want them to be able to do what you and I do. We get paid to do this. You know, sometimes we pinch ourselves. I want to see them get paid to do that. I want to see them pinch themselves because this is also going to be, for many of them, their best chance to earn a buck. Top 2% play in the NFL, right? Top 2% of the FBS. That's 11,000 players, right? Uh, total. 2% of those? Now, what if you can start making money as soon as you step on a campus? In these five years, you get to play four. I think the more you can leverage that, the better you're going to be. And I expect Alabama, Georgia, Florida to be at the forefront of those things. What I'm really interested to see is how long it's going to take Louisiana to step into this and say, hey, LSU is the place to be because LSU is still like Baton Rouge is still the place where they put in Corey Foreman's name up on billboards when he's coming through on unofficial visits. All right. I think that is where we're going to see this really start to pick up is in recruiting. Because as you're recruiting a kid to play for you, the businesses are going to recruit them to sp speak for them. And I think you're going to have more opportunities to do that in the Southeast than you would most other places. All right, RJ, uh, back to Brian Harson. One other qu question I had on in regards to him, uh, the longevity at Auburn. I mean, do, do you think he's there as long as Gus Malzahn was on the Plains? That's difficult to say, right? Because it felt like Gus was never actually getting along with the people that actually had purse strings, and yet here he was signing these contracts for like seven years, $49 billion. I think that if he wins, and by wins I mean eight, nine games, I think we're going to say you're doing a good job at Auburn. What's going to be interesting is if Auburn thinks that's good enough, right? In that way, I kind of look at Texas A&M, and I wanted the same thing about Jimbo Fisher, especially going into this year. We're talking about a program that ain't won since 1939 a national championship and yet wants to flex like that's exactly what they're about. Auburn is a lesser version of that. Now, if Brian Harson is really good at kissing babies and shaking hands, he's going to be there for quite a long time because I think that is the key there. I think if you can win the games you're supposed to win and you can make everybody feel good about having hired you, you're going to be okay. I mean, the way I always put this is you need three things to get jobs and you really only need two of them, right? Be on time, be good at your job, have people like you. I think right now people like Brian Harson. We don't know if he's good at his job at Auburn. And he's on time. Uh, one of those things goes away and he's stuck with just the one, we're going to figure out real quick whether or not he has longevity. So ask me this question in three years and we'll have an answer. Yeah, R.J. Young uh, continuing to talk college football. He writes about college football on a national level there at Fox Sports. R.J. underscore Young is the follow on Twitter. So, R.J., it's all relative, mm. depending on the program we're talking about. If we're talking about uh, the coach from Buffalo coming to, let's just say, an Auburn, you're probably not giving Auburn an A-plus or, or, or the A-plus for the hire, right? Bold face it, lie. It's all relative. Bold face lie. I would give an A-plus a for that because Lance Leipold has won six national championships, and everywhere he's gone, they win. Like, that's the other part that goes into this, guys. Like, what, who are you when you come into this space? And nobody's got a better track record getting hired this year than Lance Leipold. Seriously, who, who else would fit that resume of having won six national championships? I don't care what level. It's hard to win national championships. It's hard to go from Wisconsin Whitewater, right, to Buffalo, to Kansas. I mean, look, I'm giving them this, I'm giving the grade because I understand what it means for that dude to be in that spot. Plus, the fact that people still don't know Lance Leipold's name will change. The reason we know Brian Harson's name is Texas, right? He's offensive coordinator at Texas. It's not because of Boise State. And what do we think about Texas? We don't think a whole hell of a lot just yet. Maybe Steve Sarkeesian can change that because that place has also chewed up really good coaches. So, yeah, I would, but I think I'm looking at Auburn. I'm going, is Lance Leipold better than Gus Malzahn? That's tough, but I would have given it an A higher. I want to ask you, RJ, a question that's not necessarily relevant to our discussion so far, but I've asked a lot of folks that come on the show, and you've spent some time discussing Ohio State right. in multiple shows that you've done recently. We see all the way too early top 25s, preseason top 25s, post-spring, whatever it is. 
can you sell me on why Ohio State should be a top five football team right now other than their Ohio State? They got a better wide receiving core today than Alabama does today. That's the starter, right? They continue to put defensive line talent into the NFL draft in the first round, right? That's another one. But, and when we look at this, what do you need to win championships? You need a great defensive line. You need a great offensive line. You need a few weapons out there that can catch the ball in space and do something with it. I look at Ohio State and I say, you got to fix the secondary, right? That's the glaring hole. And if you get that fixed, then we can talk. But they also have a pretty damn good track record of doing exactly that, right? To having two first-round cornerbacks drafted just a couple years ago. And they're pretty good at linebacker. So, I mean, what we're, we're talking about is a quarterback away. But, I mean, I would make that same argument for Alabama if that was the argument I was going to make. And nobody thinks of Bryce Young being a quarterback away. Now, what Bill O'Brien's offense looks like, we'll see. But the reason I would tell you is Ryan Day, who's been pretty good, having made the playoff in both years he's been a head coach and make the national championship game. With the season starting in November, with a quarterback who we thought had broken his ribs. I mean, it's pretty good. Other than that, I mean, the, the challenge for Ohio State is going to be the challenge for Oregon. It's going to be the challenge for Oklahoma. you got to run the table. The thing about the SEC is we all acknowledge that it's great. So you can catch an L in there and still not be considered bad. Now, if Ohio State is able to run roughshod over Minnesota to start the season and then beat the hell out of Oregon, you're going to talk about them in the end of the top five, too. If they're not... Then we got a problem. Then we got a discussion. All right, RJ, before we let you go, Lance Leipold, how long did it take him to get to Kansas to a bowl game? Oh, man, ridiculously good question. I'm going to give this two years. I'm going to give this a solid two years. Year three, you ought to be winning six, seven games at Kansas, which is a scary thought for me because the last time Kansas was good, Mark Mangino, 2007, we're talking about a number three team in the country playing in an Orange Bowl, like with Todd Reesing who's a name I just don't get to mention a lot. But, yes, give it give it two years to get settled. Year three, expect them to be chasing something like six, seven games. But, you know, knowing what it has taken for him, it might be year two because that's what it was at Buffalo. And I don't think of the MAC as being, you know, anything on par with the SEC. But I think of the MAC as playing tough football, right? I, I think of it as a football league. And if you could do that at Buffalo, you ought to be able to do that at Kansas because through the middle – the Big 12 is just not outstanding. It's good. It's not outstanding. I think he can get them to the middle pretty quick, fast, and in a hurry. Well, we love the Mac because we get to watch college football on Tuesday nights in the fall. Amen! <laughs> I love that. There you go, R.J. Young. <laughs> really good stuff. National college football writer there at Fox Sports, R.J. underscore Young. Uh, the follow there on Twitter. RJ, it was a spirit of conversation. Good stuff. We appreciate you joining us here on this Monday. Hey, guys, I appreciate it. I've listened to the show off and on since I was in college. Uh, I love J-O-X. Like, I just, we don't get this kind of stuff in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I sincerely appreciate you guys being about college football and loving the sport the way I do. All right, Golden Hurricane. Good stuff, RJ. Thank, Thank you, man. All right, brother. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you, RJ.